Every boxer, they've all had different personalities, but this one is just a lover. Oh. Do you want to rock? Are we stopping to rock sample? Yes. Okay. Let's try this I one. saw some circles going on. Yes, yeah. I was. There, I was. There are circles going on, that's for sure. Rage now. These looked much better than, <laughs> than the ones, like, a minute. I hope that this thing is giant and buried and it comes out no, and you're like, no. No, no, no not again. <laughs> I'll stop, please. No, this Thank one looks you. good. What is that? Dead? Dead? Where is this sample going to go? Um, uh, let's see. Um, that can go in C, D, E, or F in starboard. Starboard? starboard. So oh, that's Port off by one. Sorry? Uh, we need, is it that, that right? Port off by one? Hold on, take a look. Yeah, we need the port camera off by one. Oh, yeah. Cameras. You want the parrot camera on? Uh, I need bio on, yeah. There you go, thank you. Wait, I lost, is it this one? Yeah, it's yeah. this one. Which is, is it in my view? The darker Should one? Yes. Yeah, I'm trying to find it in this other camera. Oh, so okay. that's... I was I wondering, I was one. like... <laughs> I think it's this one. Okay, let's hope. I was about to circle it up, but it's not going to work oh. on this screen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, at first I was confused because I was like, I thought I thought we lost sight of it, and I was confused. I was like, oh, did it move? I don't think it's in the brow cam. It might no, be in I'm the looking, still camera. I'm looking at the it's, still camera. Yeah, it would be over there. It looks nice and angular. I'm looking at it. It's alive. And go on in the starboard bio box. Yep. This one here, right? Yes. Yep. That's correct. Oh, it's that one. Cool. Were you were you right? Yeah, I was wrong. That was. Ooh. Oh, that looks good. It looks good. I like it. It's a little flat, but not too bad. It's not. It's not too bad. No, that's like a, that's it. cool there. Yeah. Very angular. I love yeah. it. Thank you. Awesome job. Thank you. That's like a good size too. That'll be, that'll fit in the rock saw easily. Yes. I like how even though there's nothing on our starboard side, Jake keeps going through these great machinations to make sure it doesn't get lost. Aww. Firing sample. First time I ever dropped a rock. <laughs> I think it leapt out. And I don't think it was you. The rock. That was the best yeah, rock no. we could have ever you, seen. Fuhaku. And you lost it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Fahaku. And what was your preferred box, Data? Um, C. Charlie? Yep. Sample collected. Sample 86. Firing dive. Roger that. Yay. All right, awesome. rock acquired. Yay. Moving on to waypoint five. Thank you, when, everyone. When nav and data are ready. Rock o'clock. Hannah, can you share a little bit about why do we want those angular rocks? Like what's special about them? How do you know what is a good rock? So we want the angular rocks because of... Good whatever. What? Oh, just laying down. Oh, oh. Know. So we want them because it'll, it's a sign that the minerals, it could have been in the beginning, like of the flow, and like when it cut off for the minerals. And um, then I'm not, I kind of forgot. I kind of forgot, but, um, yeah, but the, but we want them to because you can also see the flow pattern 
sometimes, like the angular, so that we know it was part of the original, like part of the flow, which we were actually able to see. Mike pointed it out where he was like, oh yeah, that looks really cool. And I was like, yes, because that's what we're looking for because mm -hmm. we can tell that it was part of the flow and that hopefully it will have some of those minerals that were a part of it that we're looking for, like the amphiboles, the clinopyroxenes, and plagioclase, but yeah, so it was nice, good job, Mike, for noticing that. Or which thing? The, where you were like, oh, look at that, that looks cool. Oh, yeah. That was, that was what we- On this rock? On the, yeah. Oh, cool, so, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, you said it, and I was like, yeah, that is cool, that is what we're looking for. <laughs> So for our viewers who may not know what you mean yep. by flow, because I know we're probably going to be yeah. practicing recognizing our lobate flow, Holothorium. our sheet flow. Is this lobate? Yeah. Nice. Can you explain what you mean by flow? So by flow, so similar to volcanoes on land, there are different types of flows that occur. Of, so of lava. Of lava. Flows of lava. So for example, in Hawaii, two of the flows are called ah, aha. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Two A's, yeah. Uh-uh. Uh -uh. With an apostrophe. Okay. And then Pahoehoe. Pahoe -hoe. And those are two examples of flows. One, Pahoehoe -hoe is like very stringy, like ropey looking. And then Ah-ah, uh -uh, Ah-ah uh -uh uh -uh. is very, it looks like when you touch it, it would hurt. It looks very, like, it looks it's like, jagged. It, yeah, it's jagged, jagged yeah. and and angular. Yes, yes. So, so for the type of flows that are in under, for our sea mounts are lobi, sheet, and pillow lavas. And they depend on velocity. So the fastest is sheet. And we're probably going to come across some sheets. And then there's lobi, which is middle. And it kind of looks like, I describe it as like brain texture looking. Mm -hmm. And then we have pillow lavas, which are, they look like they're in the shape of a pillow and they're, they're the slowest to form or the slowest velocity. So, and then a lot of the rocks that we pick up are pillow lavas or mm -hmm. debris from other types, any of the other types of flows. So yeah, nice. that's, that's what I meant by lava flows. Thank you for that. And Hannah, do you know much about the like the Hawaiian hotspot um, versus the Cretaceous? Because that was kind of like one of the objectives of mm -hmm. this particular dive. So I I'm not sure um, what isotopes or what the main difference is between the Hawaiian hotspot versus the one that we're looking at that formed the Cretaceous seamounts. Val probably knows more about it than I do, but the isotope signatures are different enough that it you can tell it comes from two different hot spots. So the way that we look at these isotopes is by looking at the minerals that I was mentioning earlier, like the amphiboles, clinopyroxenes, and the plagioclase. Those are, way, those are minerals that we can use to see the isotopes and to look at the percentages that the flow created. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> if Val, Val, if you, I don't know if you're still in the lounge, but if you have more to say about the Hawaiian hot spot versus this hot spot, that would, that would help. That would also, I'll write it down too. <laughs> <laughs> but if not, it's okay. Yeah. I appreciate you dropping all that geology knowledge. And I also just want to say that like, um, for anyone who maybe hasn't listened in on our watch before, like Hannah's super excited about like what she's studying and geology in general, but I just also love uh, how you're able to also say that there are some things that you still haven't learned yet. And like, you know, you're learning and yeah. growing as a person, as a student. Um, so I'm very glad that I have you on watch and I get to learn with you. No, same, you. Tori. Same. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's it's pretty daunting, like not really knowing everything. Yeah, but you I don't feel have like to. I know, but I feel like I yeah. should. Well, I feel like that's in, in undergrad. You're like, okay, I, I feel like I'm starting to understand stuff. In grad yes. school, 
you learn that you don't know anything, but that's a good thing because that leads you to ask the next questions. Yes. And that's kind of the point to the two different schools in a way. Yes, I, I agree. I agree with what you just said because... And I mean that in a good way. Like yeah, in undergrad, yeah, you're supposed yeah. to have the confidence to go to grad school. In grad school, mm -hmm. you're supposed to learn that you don't know much at all and that you're, but you get, you get the skills to begin to ask new questions, which is how we learn things. Uh, that's exactly, and I learn by, yeah, by asking questions and questions and making sure I listen. Because another thing that's difficult for me is when somebody's just talking or like, like let's just say in class where they're just giving a lecture. I've noticed that for me, a lot of the times, like I'll check out like mentally when they start talking. <laughs> and it's really like, I check myself too. And I'm like, you gotta pay attention. And then I, I'll Good write it down. And luckily from Zoom. Lounge to van. <gasps> Hey, Val. How's the terrain Val. moving forward? The floor is yours. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> I kind of heard my name and I was like, Oh, yes. uh -oh. oh you, we was, definitely said your was, name. <laughs> um, what is different from the Hawaiian hotspot to the one that could have formed the cur during the Cretaceous? Uh, okay, so you know, something with a really short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so uh, and there are several different uh, metals that we use uh, that have, uh, you know, uh, the same element, but several different uh, isotopes. So, um, you know, uh, you can have like, say, uh, neodymium, you have 143, uh, AMU, neodymium, 144, 142, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're, we're looking for little uh, uh, variations in things like neodymium or strontium or lead uh, isotopes. Uh, that can help tell apart the uh, two hotspot tracks because uh, uh, Hawaii has a uh, has its own uh, isotopic signature, uh, and we we know what it looks like along uh, the Northwest Hawaiian Ridge, and then uh, this other hotspot that we think might have been uh, active here in the Cretaceous uh, has uh, its own distinct uh, uh, isotopic composition where um, um, you know, we have a different proportion of uh, uh, some of those different masses in each element. And then, of course, the, uh, uh, the age determinations are uh, uh, pretty distinct, too, between these two hotspots uh, that, that we're studying. Um, the difference at this intersection point that we're at right here between the two tracks uh, is going to be somewhere on the order of approximately 60 million years. And the Hawaiian one was older? Uh, the Hawaiian one is younger. Oh, okay. Wow. Thanks for that. Thank you, yeah, thanks. That really awesome. helps. You're welcome. And that's looking at amphiboles and clanoparaxines and stuff? Uh, for the age determinations, yeah. Uh, I tend to use whole rock most of the time, so like the ground oh, mass okay, and stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for, for my own work. But cool. um, it's it's altered. It's been sitting on the seafloor for a long time, so I usually have to do some extra processing to that to extract the original uh, signature of the lava out without all of like the seawater and carbonates oh, yeah. and stuff mixed in. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank yeah, you. You're welcome. Thank you. Love it. So, looking at which nindymium, strontium, lead, you can plot those all and you'll see like a trend. Yeah. And usually, whatever the trend is, I know there's something that we overlay it to that um, kind of shows where it is in relation to the flood, like to where the hotspot is like that we're talking about is I don't know it, it's like a big it once we get this information we just put it into a big chart and then like see where everything aligns and just try to make interpretations from where it's plotted and that's a cool thing I think about um, this expedition in particular is that we have those um, people scientists on shore and on board that really can tell a fuller story of the research and the work that we're doing on board so that like collaboration across disciplines is so cool mm -hmm. it really is i think that's one of the hallmarks of um, the oet um, this particular expedition i agree because it's also what keeps me so curious and excited about what i do is because it's trying to put a bigger picture together a story together and that's one thing that Val also discusses a lot is how the Hawaiians, a lot of their stories give you, like can have a geological aspect to it because of the way that they described how the Hawaiian islands were formed mm -hmm. is very similar to how the hotspot interacted 
during that time to form also the Hawaiian Islands. Absolutely. And so it's so it's so amazing how observant the Hawaiian people were, mm -hmm. and it, it's and awesome. continue to be. You know, it's we have the repositories in our oral narratives of the stories of the creation of the Hawaiian Islands. Mm -hmm. And so that deep observation and intimate relationship is born from our connection to this place. And um, those stories incredibly have been passed down for at least a thousand years of this natural history of Hawaii. And so the data has been collected, it's been analyzed by Kanaka O'ivi, Hawaiians, and we continue to add to that repository of our observations, um, you know, our kilo practices, um, and our questions that we ask as well. So I think if you look at indigenous knowledge, um, it has that time depth mm -hmm. of understanding of the relationships, you know, because everything is looked at like you're one component of a system and you're not outside of that as humans. And so I think it gives it a richer um, understanding of your place in the world. And for me, that's like the richest part of it is that humans aren't separated out, that we're really a part of the system and we all depend on each other. Mm -hmm. You know, every single organism depends on each other to survive. Yeah, I think it's really important to constantly highlight all like the indigenous people of Hawaii and how their their deep intimate relationship with nature is just so unique and I I get goosebumps every time like that I read about that I'm like oh my gosh this is crazy how they knew so much mm -hmm. before anything was really like discussed about about it in geology because I don't know I feel like a lot of hotspot geology has only happened in like probably like maybe like mm -hmm. the 50s 60s I'm not sure but basically like not as long as probably the Hawaiians had it Oh, absolutely. Yeah, science is a very modern invention. Mm -hmm. You know, um, indigenous knowledge is ancient. Exactly. And it's, it's um, the, the, the two of them, they're both valid systems of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And we can use both to really deepen our understanding of the natural environment and those relationships absolutely. between these different ecosystems. Because I think sometimes in science, we kind of just go off in these very kind of vacuums mm -hmm. we focus on only one particular part of an ecosystem without looking at this deeper connections mm -hmm. and when you understand those relationships and it gives you a, a much a better holistic understanding of the system as a whole so that's where I think indigenous knowledge has much to teach scientific mm -hmm. method absolutely I agree thank you yeah I'm going to look up now when the, <laughs> I'll let you know. I know mm -hmm. it's going to be younger than <laughs> the Hawaiians ancient intimate relationship with nature and it's Yeah, I think in the 19 Jagger maybe have been one of the new uh, geologists um, the Jagger Museum over at the National Park. I think 1910s, 1920s maybe is when that kind of field of study started. While Hannah's looking this up, this is Sorry, an amazing yeah. conversation that I want to keep going. But Sebastian, what was that sponge we were looking at? That is, uh, according to Chris Kelly, an Atlanticella species of glass sponge. A glass sponge, nice. 1963 was when it was first. Ooh, ooh. good year. Up. Yeah, it's, o it's only been around about 50 yeah. or 60 years. Yeah, uh, formally, plate motion modeling about just over 50 years. Compared yeah. to the Hawaiian knowledge, like Hawaiian, is it repository? Is that or yeah. history, it, ancient yeah. history? Yeah, it's it's kind of a um, a repository. Like um, vaihona is a Hawaiian word, um, and vai means like rich. Vai also means water, fresh water, and so there's that correlation that what makes a place rich is the living water. And so our repositories of knowledge are living 
repositories. And so, um, yeah, and they're, they're in the, the stories of Pele and her sisters, you know, these are, these are accounts of how they, the Hawaiian Islands were formed. And the oldest islands we know are here in Popohana Mokakea. Mm. And our oral narratives um, substantiate that. You know, that these are the islands that are the oldest. And it's all part of our oral narratives and the stories that are passed down. Mm -hmm. And so that, um, it, it just, oral narratives are supported by science as we delve deeper into them. So was a lot of ancient Hawaiian um, stories, were they written or were they more like word of mouth? It's all oral. oral so the okay. written word wasn't um, part of our culture. Okay. And um, those stories were passed. So transmission wise, you know, that to me is incredible that yeah. the stories are passed down for at least a thousand, 1500 years and they maintain their accuracy, they maintain Fish. their values, they maintain those things that were important to our ancestors. That's incredible. And so, um, yeah, and, and for me, when I think about that, I'm like, wow, you know, and this is true for many indigenous cultures, that you had experts that were those people who passed on the history, the historians, the genealogists, that had to memorize like supercomputers. Mm -hmm. These are supercomputers they were using in their heads to wow. pass that down to the next generation. Wow. So it's quite incredible. Wow. That must have been, though, so fun to like go and listen to those stories. And so most of them were written. Okay. So when, um, you know, the first um, contact with Europeans um, who were here and then writing, Hawaiians took on writing like in the 1820s um, and they just took it to another level. So Hawaii had the highest literacy rate in the world. Over 90% of our people could read and write in the Hawaiian language, which was a language of government, of commerce. Everything revolved around the Hawaiian language. Mind you, the United States, I believe, was like maybe 65% at that time. Uh, Russia was maybe 17% literacy rate. So the Hawaiian Kingdom was like the most absolutely literate place in the world, you know, during the 1840s. And this happened within two decades where they took the written word and they spread it out there. They had Hawaiian teachers that went out to, to every parts of the islands and taught in a native way through chanting, through clapping, um, by that type of recitation of memorizing like the chants and they just use that to do for the written language so just an incredibly progressive nation that took new ideas and used it to better the welfare of the people and the kingdom so i mean we had lights in iolani palace before the white house and before um what's the palace in britain uh, buckingham. buckingham palace yeah iolani palace had electricity several years before the White House. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like we were progressive. Our King Kalakaua was the first sovereign um, head of state to circumnavigate the globe. This is yeah. like in the 1870s. Like, like if you look at the Hawaiian kingdom and the progression, it is incredible. Mm -hmm. It really is. Wow. I know that we talked uh, on one of our previous watches about how like for teachers especially, like we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Like mm -hmm. there's so much that we can learn from educators that come before us. So that's amazing for me to hear, especially about all that literacy you said in two decades. In two so decades. I'm wondering yeah. like mm -hmm. during the Hawaiian like language uh, resurgence or I think Renaissance, mm -hmm. I've heard it called. Mm -hmm. um, how were people like uh, inspired, I guess, by that period of time and like teaching and learning Hawaiian language? Yeah, so the 1970s, late 1960s, early 1970s, there were several things going on. Um, there was a resurgence of traditional Polynesian voyaging. Um, so the Hokulea, 1976, took its first voyage from Hawaii down to Tahiti. Mind you, this is, nobody knew how that outcome was going to be. All they knew was that we're going to reinstitute something that we were so good at. Yeah. Um, there was also hula that was being revived 
um, and the language is part of that because we know that language is culture. If you don't have language, you have no culture. And so there was all this multiple like um, re reignition of cultural pride. Um, lots of people who were standing up for their rights to to protect Hawaiian lands that were being overdeveloped or literally stolen um, from the Hawaiian homes and from you know places where Hawaiians traditionally had rights to. So it was like a ignition of pride in the people, in the Lakui, in the nation. And that like when you come to the end of your rope, you're either gonna give up or you're gonna fight back. Mm -hmm. And the Hawaiians chose to fight back. And because of those people who fought back, my mother being one of them, mm -hmm. um, because she was very involved in the um, reignition of the Hawaiian language, um, you know, this blossomed into what we have today of over 30,000 um, people who speak Ulelo Hawaii with over 3,000 students in Hawaiian language um, immersion schools wow. with hula on the world stage during Mary Monarch with the voyages that are occurring right now with the Polynesian Voyaging Society around the entire Pacific, a four-year voyage. So these are the fruits of those seeds that were planted that our ancestors planted in us. Um, so, so it's a beautiful flowering. Yeah, the gardens are starting to get, you know, ripe and rich and, and it, it only can continue when people are invested in their culture. And as a side note, this is happening in Ireland as well, oh, with yep. the traditional languages there. And so, you know, that reinstitution of language is going on all over the world. Right. Thinking about Irish Ireland, they just, there was a movie that came out recently and Can we get a oh. zoom on this one, please? Yeah, maybe at a 90. Be quick. Not a bamboo, at least from the front, this part. I'll put the I focus further it. down the stock and come out a bit. Yeah, look at the base and I'll see. Base. Base. I don't see Hi, it. I do. There's two right there. See them? Uh, right there. Oh, yeah, you can barely see them. Yep. Like barely. Yeah, it's coming barely out. A bamboo. Played I-4. Thank you, Osaka. Do bamboo coral ever have, like, a different color? Um, I think they have plenty of other colors. Um, I don't think we observed many on this dive. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure they do have quite a few colors. Chrysogorgid. Looks like we're looking at a low bait flow. You see, like Can you little, describe, yeah, yeah. Like that's what I think. Brain. It has that bacterial look, right? That's I mean, I, I can't tell. I couldn't. I didn't notice if it had a bacterial texture or not. Bacterial is like the round, right? Yeah, the the grape like. Yeah. Oh, you're saying that. Low bait flows in general look like bacterial, like giant bacterioidals. Um, I don't think so. Fine. I don't. 
I don't, I personally don't see it. Well, I feel like I'm being attacked right now. No, I'm just saying I personally don't <laughs> see it. <laughs> but if that helps you, like, I'm not going to disagree. <laughs> The, be the back row has been uh, been fighting these, these watches today. <laughs> this is just me and Sebastian's relationship, okay? We are very snippy with each other for some reason. Just, that's just how our dynamic works. I, know, I thought you could attribute it to your uh, astrology. Okay, let's not talk about astrology. Also. <laughs> Nobody needs to know. <laughs> Nobody needs to know. So, Hannah, right now what we're looking at, you said this looks like a... Oh, wait. Hold up, we're changed. Let me, oh. Give me a moment. Because I'm curious yes. about the rocks that look separated. Yes, like yes, individual yes. Rocks. Cause so, okay, so right now, what I, going through my, if I was speaking my thoughts out loud right now, what okay. I would be thinking is, what I am thinking is, <laughs> um, so there's so much sediment. I can't tell if the sediment is like, it like spaces between it, like it, like not connected to it at all mm -hmm. or if it is connected but looking at this it kind of looks like low bait that's and then this looks kind of like broken off but to me like seeing these little divots that's that's looking like low bait to me so Hannah I have a question so are these types these um, different types of um, lava are they kind of that kind of classification used around the world or do different countries have like different do they use pillows do they use a low bait is that kind of a standard i believe that's standard for on like seamounts oh, okay i believe so but uh i'm not because i'm trying to think if I'm not sure, but now I'm thinking for also, also other basaltic lava flows like in Hawaii, do we use the Hawaiian terms? Is mm -hmm. that universal? Mm -hmm. I want to look that up now because I don't know. I never thought about that. And I'm just curious, like other places that have volcanic eruptions, you know, there's so many of them, especially around the Pacific, the Ring of Fire. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious what their terms are. And if there is kind of like a standardized... I wonder if... Because there, there are other indigenous people uh -huh. living on these islands. And I wonder if those people have their own descriptions for the Absolutely. lava flows. Absolutely. I bet they do. Just how the Hawaiians use mm -hmm. hoi hoi and ah ah ah. <laughs> but I don't know. That that makes me really curious. And I, I want to know. I could probably would ask. Volcanologists all use the same terminology, but the local yeah. cultures would have their own descriptive yeah. naming. So, I honestly, now I want to ask Else if Palau has any. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to ask her if they have any terms for. Because mm -hmm. that's interesting. But even in the scientific community, I'm just curious. Oh, I'm like pretty in, sure, in yeah. In countries you know, that are not American, like. You know, I'm curious as to what they're using. I think it's, I think like Derek said, it's universal. But I'm curious about the hoi hoi and uh, if that's also universal. I'm pretty sure they are. They are? Okay, good. I think I've heard they are. You can report back in December after EGU. <laughs> I, well, I want to find out now. <laughs> <laughs> Was that more of the, um, what's it called? Was that rock you avoid? Wait, what? Was, the, was that rock with the such a P that you avoid? Pumice? Pumice. I guess yeah. it's all pumice rock. Yeah, right there? Oh, no, it was before, but that oh. also looks like one, I guess. And Val says uh, terminology is pretty standard globally. Good. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Because when I looked it up, it was, it's like confused. That was another great question about language, Malia, and how like even in the scientific um, world or community, just how language and the words we're using are important and how they may differ.
just real fast. This is a low bait flow right here. Okay, sorry, continue. <laughs> no, that's okay. I know we have viewers that, you know, this may be the first time that they're ever hearing uh, low bait flow or sheet flow, and I love that we're learning together how to identify them. Yeah, I, I realize I just need to start sometimes, like, I've, I'm saying this stuff in my head, and then, <laughs> or I'm trying to figure it out in my head, and then I just don't, sit, like, I have it, and then I don't share it, and then I, and then I catch myself, and I'm like, oh, I should say something, and then usually somebody's talking, and I'm like, well, what they're saying is more important, so then I'm like, it's fine, it's yeah. a constant, like, that's, that's just my thought process, just giving a, no, I feel like that's a, a fair description about just, uh, you know, being and talking on the science party line in our conversation can keep heading unless you uh, change it, let's go to waypoint five. Are all you know working together and conversing in here, but like I know each of us are kind of like looking at these screens and thinking or seeing someone something differently. So sometimes we might be having a conversation that's in one I mean, direction. I could go right if you want. It's just like I it multitask. Like the ridge just keeps at the same distance. Listening because it's so interesting, and then I'm also like identifying. Yes, at the like same time. So whenever I identify, I'm like, and there's a conversation. I'm like, I don't want to cut them off. Because I'm, I'm also listening to what they're saying. That doesn't bother anybody in the front row. We do it all the time. <laughs> Fish. It's fun. You should try it. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just kidding. I usually wait for a pause and sneak it in if as quick as no I can. If there's no pause, then you just got to go. Yeah. I use my East Coast fast talking if I have to. Derek, I can hear you, but you're, like, very quiet. Uh, where's he at? Is it plus six? We can go up more. Rat tail? It doesn't look like rat tail to me. Okay. Zoomage. Partial. It looks deformed. Is the white area on its head like you scarring? See inside those scarring. Full beans. He's been through it. Oh, little guy. What oh kind goodness. of fish is this? Um, I'm trying Sebastian? to find it right now. Oh, it's crispy to it, which I'm feeling is moving in the background. I think he's got some... Oh, got you some can see uh, a It's like it found a weed eater. Texture? Oh, that laser's on What there. a pose. <gasps> Look, he yeah. put his hand on it. Oh. Trying to get the whole <laughs> organism. Bam. I'm jealous of him that he's touching the rock. I wish I could touch the rock. <laughs> what do you call that when that there's, there's like a midline, but then it meets in a higher midline? You know what I'm talking about? A, a midline, like the... Like see, there's a midline, midline but yeah. then there's a white dotted thing above the midline. Is or? that also a scar? No, that's not a scar. That's a morphological feature. Um, Virginia said lateral line. Lateral line. Lateral, thank you. That's what I'm looking for. Thanks, Virginia. Lateral line. I'm not sure we've seen this one yet. Looks different to me, but... It's got an unusual color, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So next one, let's check it. Let's see. Virginia said they saw it this morning. Okay. okay. Was it the same one? Yeah, it's an op uh, Ophidi form. She said, uh, she sent a link. Yeah, I, I think I have it right here, actually. Ophidio. Uh, Why? Did it catch up? I not pronounce Scootin'. This. Yeah, I think this is what I clicked on, too. It's with it loads. Yeah. But the visibility is amazing. Like our light is shining way Poma. far off there. Diplocanthopoma. Or the Dipla Canthopoma. Dipla Canthopoma. Oh, uh, no, um, Chris corrected us both. It's Catyrix Hawaiinensis. Hawaiinensis, yes, yeah. I feel like oh. biologists should have their own like spelling bee competition. And I think that would be so much fun to go watch. And then 
Yeah. Just oh. like to hear all of how like y'all pronounce everything. Interesting. It's a live bearing fish. Oh really? Yeah. Huh. It's in the cuskiel order, but not a fam not family because it's live bear. What does that mean? So it's kind of like it's a cuskiel, but cuskiels normally lay eggs. This guy gives birth. Oh. Well, is it a guy or a female that gives birth? <laughs> Um, yeah. Even birth. though you all insist it's a male. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bridge, no? I'd like to do a different ship move going five zero meters at bearing two two zero. Same two, speed, please. Two zero. Zero point three. I think that'd be a good uh, double header of game shows is uh, biologist spelling bee and yeah. then uh, what is it? That's Wheel correct. of Fortune in Hawaiian. <gasps> that'd be so much fun. They yeah. need a board about two miles wide though. I'm just gonna see if we can get up on that. <laughs> oh wait, Chris is correcting himself. Let's we'll see what he says now. Yes, yeah, so if we have a spelling bee, we'll start with Toronto cops, so we get rid of. Um, <laughs> get rid of half of the room. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I'm out. I'm out. Oh, oh no, I would definitely just be in the audience. Oh no. <laughs> Unless you like to see me mess up spelling, and then everybody will laugh. <laughs> I think it's interesting when I hear the description of the spelling of Hawaiian words, how many of the modifiers I don't know at all because they're just not commonly used in English except in pronunciation guides. We're looking at a low bait flow. And then some rock uh, fragments at the Chris bottom. is correcting himself not on the species, on the fact that it's a live bearer. Ah. He says that what defines the species is the split lateral line. So the lateral line, looking at the dots, instead of it being yeah. continuous, it kind of got cut off and then yeah. cut lower. Yeah, that's a defining That seemed trait. notable to me. Well done, Ed. No, it just seemed weird. It's not like I'm a <laughs> biologist. Well, it's a good observation. That would have defined its species. Thank you, Chris Kelly. That was Chris Kelly, right? Yep. Yeah. It's going to be 8 o'clock. We're going to lose Chris at some point here. wealth of knowledge. We gave uh, Chris a chat account just so his wife doesn't have to hear him yelling at the monitor. <laughs> 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 no, you're wrong. You're completely wrong. Now he can tell us. So I just wanted to recognize we have so many people in the chat dropping all kinds of yeah. questions and thoughts right now. One, that I'm noticing that I think this is a great question. They're asking if we find that visibility is better in areas where there are a higher amount of sponges. Oh, that is an excellent question. I have not correlated the two before, but we'll keep an eye on that. Jake, you have any uh, what was that? Do you think we've seen better vis visibility where there's more sponges? Visibility where there's more sponges. Uh, I would tend to think it's the opposite because don't the sponges feed on mm. particulates in the water column? That's what I was thinking. Yeah. So turbidity would be increased and that would make visibility worse? Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. They're going to be in areas of poor visibility on purpose. More food. Yeah. But they are great filter filters of water, so I understand the question. Mm -hmm. We've also got another shout out for Chris Kelly, a viewer, just thanking him for being such a great teacher oh, and yes. being able to learn so much from him um, by viewing on Nautilus Live. <laughs> so Chris stands corrected. It's uh, not the species he thought it was. It is a cata, cata etix. Isn't that, that what he just a, said? That is the species he said. Is it? Yeah. 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 Is it? Look, Look. Like five messages. Oh up. yeah, it is cata. Oh, oh. oh. dumping ballast. Chris, oh. 
I think it's all done. Oh yeah, I think Chris is right. Oh, maybe not. Oh, more. There's things. another little bit. This one down here? Yeah. About right at the base of that. Dumping event? Yeah. Just can't get privacy. Oh. Is it sitting on top of some oh. bachi No, it's going for a flight. Yes. Oh, it's going for a ride? Yes, Tori. Oh, there it goes. Yep. Now that it dumped ballast, doesn't. No, it floats away. Yep. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. He's just swimming. Needs to find a new sand patch. They move funny. They undulate to get through the water. Mm. As a scientific term, I believe. <laughs> it's doing the worm. <laughs> That's a great descriptive word, undulate. Certainly not very efficient. But I mean, they are beautiful. Number, it's very efficient. <laughs> I feel like we should have music to him moving like that. I think you just did the Mission Impossible theme. Yeah, I did. Da -da -da. <laughs> da -da. And Sebastian, that's a crinoid on that sponge? Crinoid. Yep. Crinoid or Brzingid. We're slowly learning. The challenge is going to be when the guys actually see a Brzingid. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna think it's a, we're totally gonna think it's a crinoid. <laughs> but yes, um, Chris is correct. Also, he looked up. He's correct on live bearing. So, is both those facts are correct on the fish? So, if we just stuck with what he said originally, we would have been fine. <laughs> yes. That feels even more verified now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's double verified. Without Gorgia. Also, we never finished our introductions with the pets, but someone did suggest yeah, we that did. we needed to share. Ed, did, did oh. Ed share? I don't think so, but someone suggested that we needed to share some of our pet pictures on Instagram, which I think is fair, because we were sitting here yes. looking at these pictures, yes. saying, oh, so cute, and no one can see them. That's what my, my sister, she was also watching, and she was like, I wish I could see all these pets, and I was like, oh. I know. Not updating them. We should do it. Yeah. Ed, did you share? That would be a that would be a Megan call. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> we talked about Arlo earlier. I don't know if that was. I don't think that was this watch though. I don't think it was. But I do remember that. No, we have a Aussie uh, blue healer uh, and Chow mix named Arlo, who uh, loves to run. And then when he's not running, loves to just curl up on top of you and take a nap. And he was preceded by the best dog ever, Cooper the Wonder Dog, who was a Kali Basinji mix, uh, who would never bark, never, ever bark, but would talk all the time. Uh, and was the best dog ever. Best dog ever. It's a hard gig to follow up on. Yeah. yeah. And Cooper was preceded by... Uh, a purebred corgi uh, from one of the litters that my mom was uh, named Kristen Sweet Abigail, or Abby for short. And her parents were, or his, well, no, her parents were Lord Malcolm and Lady Martha. My mom used to have corgis, or puppies running all over her place. And that was the best. Hi, Jaina. We've got some. Hi, Jacob. Some dinner change, change out over here. Aloha. Um, question or yeah, question for Sebastian. Um, how do we know for sure that like every species we're looking at has been identified before? Like, what are you using to help you? And then, like, how do we know if we're looking at something that has not been described before? Uh, that is a fantastic question. Um, generally, um, most data loggers up here aren't trained down to the species level for every single species. Mm -hmm. um, generally, we have specialists in our chat that specialize in certain organisms and families that can make those IDs for us and mm -hmm. be like, okay, this is just slightly different from those other species, so it must be a new species. And they can tell us that. When, in the absence of those specialists, we have a benthic 
method, a benthic animal identification guide made by NOAA that we use to try to do our best matches as possible. And generally, there's a lot of species in deep sea that are going to be so out there compared to anything in these guides that mm -hmm. where it's usually a safe assumption that they are new to science, especially yeah. in these newly explored habitats. Yes. I feel like we found the edge of that ridge. So now I'm trying to just go up it without going off Looks the edge. Looks like it, yeah. I feel like this is a good time to mention then that you know, right now we're looking at Willard Seamount that was first mapped in 2014 and everything that we're seeing right now is the very first time that humans have seen the sponge, these rocks, and we never know what's around the corner and what else might be revealed to us. It's an interesting shape, yeah. sponge. Yeah, it's very flat looking, but like planar. I think there was like in the before. Less like flat. So are these low weight flows, Hannah? Actually, what I was just thinking in my head was trying to discern if it was low bait or sheep. It looks pretty bacterial it, it, to it me. That is so weird that you just said that. So weird. So um, we're just tracking a line at bearing one seven zero. I'm right leaning now. more towards low bait flow, but See, I, I need don't... more. Yeah, because it was very bacterial. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I mean, they look like large yes, grapes. Yes, I stand, I stand by my decision. Yeah, because they're battery idle. No. I see you're like, I stand uncorrected. <laughs> <laughs> Is it fair to say that lobate looks kind of like lumpy? Yes. I Not botryoidal. Botryoidal is kind of like lumpy. Little, little lumps. Yeah. Like very like, like boiling water looking lumps. But this is bigger scale. Please no. Please, please don't call the texture of lobate botryoidal. Please. Jacob? Oh. <laughs> yeah, so these are just rock fragments and maybe pillow, but I don't really see that many. It's just broken up. <laughs> There's a cry noise. Yep. Mike, could you share a little bit about how we plan our dives and how we decide like what specific objectives or our missions are when we come out here? Please. Yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, we're trying to characterize uh, these seamounts. So uh, they've, they've been, some of them have been mapped, like this one was mapped in 2014 by Falcor. Uh, other ones have not, so we'll, we'll, we map them ahead of, of, ahead of time. So we, we still map, you know, during all of our transits. Um, and then you know, we look at the bathymetry and try, we don't want to dive on areas that are like just full of sediment because you know, you're not going to have anything growing on that or you're not going to look at the geology. So we kind of plan it 
these dives up along um, the highs. So we might, this one we started at the base um, of the canyon, but then came up the, the side. Other ones will start like kind of maybe halfway down the seamount. We try to get to like 2,500 meters um, and then come up to the summit uh, along a ridge so that we have hard bottom for uh, different biological organisms to grow on, like you've seen here, uh, as well as being able to look at the rock. If we, if we did too much in like the valleys between the ridges or, or at the base, we're gonna see mostly sediment. So we try to define it, um, the, the ROV track and, and uh, the transect based on uh, the bathymetry and, and sort of where the, the rocky parts are gonna be. Nice, thank you. And we've been, maybe uh, some of our viewers that were wondering that were here when we've taken some of our rock samples. So Hannah, could you share a little bit, and I know you've talked about it before, but for anyone who maybe is like just joining us, like what are we hoping to learn from these rocks? So we're, we're hoping to learn their uh, hotspot origin or their mantle plume origin by looking at, like we mentioned earlier, the different isotopes. So like mandemian, strontium, lead, and also determining their ages. So trying to figure out when they occurred and when they formed during geolo through time or geologic time because getting their ages, we can track um, paleo plate movement. And so similar to the Hawaiian hotspot, it's a line, right? And in the line, there's multiple different islands that were formed from the hotspot. So getting those ages from each of those islands, we're able to move the plate through time and see what it was like and how they moved. And that can also be the same for the seamounts that we're looking at right now. And since we don't know their ages yet, it's really important to try to place it in that period of time of where the plate is. So for example, during the Cretaceous, there were two global plate repositioning events so we're trying to see where it started, because again, there's one there's one that started in, well, there's a study that says it started in the Indian, o Indian Ocean, and there's also one that is suggesting that maybe it started in the Pacific Ocean, but we don't have enough information about these seamounts to be able to tell what the plate motion is. And Sorry, I, that what started in the Indian Ocean? The global, global plate repositioning event. Oh, right, right, right. So, that's when all the all the plates move on, on a global scale. It's a very, yes. yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, what was happening before that? So, I can't remember. I can't remember what was happening before that. But I'm sure, all I know is that the Pacific Ocean during this time was 60% of the world's oceans, and now it is currently 50% of the world's oceans. So it grew, well, it lost 10% of its size today. So also during that time, the water level was 170 meters higher than it is right now. Mm -hmm. So that gave us epicontinental seas. So like in the United States, mm -hmm. we have like the Grand Canyon and like there's a lot of limestone that's formed over there and that can be can attributed to the epicontinental sea. Wow. Um, so the global plate repositioning event, Fish. actually Dr. Oh, yeah. Conrad, who has actually been on a Nautilus expedition before, one of his students is looking at the, trying to determine if the global plate repositioning event actually happened in the Indian Ocean or it happened in the Pacific Ocean using this data from the Nautilus. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, that's oh, some things nice. that we're looking for from it. these rocks. And right now we're looking at, it looks like a bit of a low bait flow up here and then rock fragments and pillow lavas. But yeah, that was a great question. Mm -hmm. Again, there's just so much that we don't, we don't know. Yeah. And a great place to start is determining the ages and getting, getting that basic out of the way for better more clarity on geological history. It's really exciting. I was about to say, yeah, it's so exciting to hear that, that we don't really know that yet, or that's something we're still wondering, or questions we're still asking. That's an, oh, this is low bait flow. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. So yeah, I'm just gonna start saying it out loud all the time now. 
I like um, one of the things I remember from grad school, and maybe maybe the the ideas on it have changed in the last ten years, but um, that plate tectonics are driven by one or or both of uh, ridge push and slab pull. Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. still? Yeah. So like. Yeah, they still. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the weight of a plate that's like on a subduction zone that's going back into the under the under the slab or it's going back on into the mantle. Like the, the weight of that pulls the rest of the plate in that direction. Also, the, the upwelling of, of mag magma at the mid-ocean ridges kind of pushes the plate out. So it's, I think it's both. Uh, but, I, you know, I think which, there are a lot of factors that probably yeah. go into it. And so that's kind of what drives um, the movement of the plates. And so sometimes, like we're kind of in a s relatively slow and stable little areas of movement, but some, some periods in geology, there's much faster movement of plates, um, and that that can be due to more active volcanism along the mid-ocean ridges, um, potentially, or a lot of other factors as well. Yeah. But but those are two of the driving forces of the movement of plates, which I thought was really fascinating because it, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, the weight of a slab is going to pull the entire thing in that direction, and and uh, you know put lava pushing up is also going to push stuff. So I, I like those because they're really they're concepts that I can actually get my head around yeah. pretty easily. And and you know also explain global plate dynamics. Yeah, no, and again, in geology, one thing that I notice is that a lot of, um, a lot of things that have happened could be a combination of a lot of different mm -hmm. other things. Like, they, a lot of things can go together. So, it's just, it's crazy, because I think one of the first classes, that I took a mass extinction class, so that was really fun, but, um, and kind of dark. It's kind of dark, <laughs> but it was really interesting because yeah. we were no, looking is, at all yeah, the different factors of what can contribute to a max extinction. And yeah. one of our final papers was discussing how do you believe after taking this class that when a mat when the meteor hit, that that was the only thing that caused the the end of the dinosaurs? And no way. No. no. Exactly. No. No way. So I think my favorite piece of evidence, which I read, I forget where, but I was just like, oh, wow, is that, so the KT boundary, which is the, the small... KPG. What? It's KPG boundary. Oh, they changed it? Yeah, they anyway, changed it. It used to be the KT boundary, but KPG now. Yes. Um, see, I, I haven't done geology in a while. <laughs> um, is is the small layer of, the thin layer of ash mm -hmm. that you can find globally yes. from the impact uh, that, that cast up all of that. Yes. And it, it's fragments... Uh, or pa basically pulverized fragments of the meteor because it mm -hmm. contains elements that are not found on Iridium. Earth, iridium that's only found in space. So the idea is that that boundary is is basically below that is where dinosaurs existed, mm -hmm. above that is where they don't. Mm -hmm. But there are no dinosaur skeletons or fossils right covered by that bound that layer. They're not like right in that layer. They're below it. Like why? Are, if it, if that was what if that impact killed all the dinosaurs. There should be dinosaur skeletons with a layer of ash right above them, and there's not. Above them? Like right on top of yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're I'm picturing. They're below in the rock, but they're yeah. not like covered directly by this la layer, of layer of ash. And there should have been something preserved like that, but there isn't that we found. Yeah. And that's 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 a strange question. Like, well, if if that's the only thing that led to the dino, they would have all been killed in that period. So it should have been. Universal. Yeah. yeah. And it should have been. Unfair. And it should be. Some of it should have been preserved. I don't think we found a single dinosaur skeleton with that layer of ash on it. Yeah. No, it was. I love that class. It yeah. Was, no, it's it it's really so fascinating because it it shows you how little. I mean, we know that there have been mass extinctions, but we really don't know a lot of the causes, and it really speaks to a lot of like climate, global dynamics, like on a planetary scale. Ocean. But, yeah, the ocean. Ocean um, currents. So these, it's really like it's looking at evidence of biology but it's really looking at the dynamics of a planet as to why it happened and it's it really takes all levels of science into into account yeah. it's also the history of the earth which i think is fascinating yeah and again like i know there's a thing that's like oh earth six mass extinction is going on right now or like yeah, yeah you know that there's that saying and i think one of the cool things about also learning about mass extinctions is you know it's during the cretaceous it was a lot can we get a than look at that or that brown thing is on the edge right there that brown, uh, what on, thing? At the edge of the screen. Yeah, that, that brown thing right there, down there. Is that? Yeah, they want to peer at that. 
Uh, just so you guys know, back row, we are on the move here, so we can stop and look at stuff briefly. Right, um, if we do want to stop and sample, we'll have to kind of go back. What are we looking at? Oh, this? Yes. Yeah. Good eye there. Go ahead, zoom. Uh, it's just a little dead sponge. Is that right just so that some kind of encrusting sponge or alteration on the rock? Or yeah, what? it's a sponge. Sponge? Yeah. That'd be cool if that was alteration. Yeah. It wouldn't be so localized, oh. I don't think. And then okay, the zoom out. texture. Yeah, that's botryoidal. Yeah. Uh, looks yeah, singular. Also, this looks like multiple lava flows on top of each yeah. other. Multiple lobate flows. Yes. Oh. Pinoid or Brzingit? Brzingit. Brzingit. <laughs> it didn't have the, the spiky reaches. Oh, okay. But, so, back when I was saying about yeah. the Cretaceous. Um, there was just, wait, I was saying how there was so much that was going on during the Cretaceous. It was warmer. Yes, it was warmer. That's another thing. I love comparing the Cretaceous to our time now because it was a lot warmer. And I was just trying to think or like picture what the earth would look like if we had that like same temperature, if we ever yeah. got to that temperature, if that is similar to what we'll have to live with. Yeah, it was, uh, there were no ice caps no, no, during the Cretaceous. None. And one of, the, one of the major things is that if, if there's no land mass on either pole, it's harder mm -hmm. to get a, a, a massive glacier. Uh, which mm -hmm. is why the Arctic Ocean has mostly sea ice and not massive glaciers, whereas Antarctica, because it needs that stable platform to, have to form a, a glacier, like a big glacier. Um, so the Cretaceous had no land mass on either pole, so in addition to the warmth, it, which it may have contributed to the warming. Yeah. No, and again, something that I found out interesting, too, was like, technically we're in a glacial period right now. Technically, yeah. Technically, but... Relative really, to yes, other periods. Yes, yeah. relative to other periods. So it's kind of crazy that. Yeah, I think when we talk about global warming, it's it's not so much uh, an issue of you know if the of an entire mass extinction. I think it's just an issue of if the, if humans can occupy the Earth the way we have. Mm -hmm. A lot of our coastal cities are going to have trouble, that sort of thing. But I don't think it's it's going to be a sort of a okay. mass biological extinction. Yeah. It's just it's going to be a pain in the butt for a lot of where we yeah, live. Yeah, yeah, especially. Louisiana or any. Yeah. yeah, all of Florida. Yeah, all of Florida. <laughs> I know, Hannah, we've been talking about mass extinctions because I told you that this summer I went to the Field Museum in Chicago yes. and I got to see Sue. Yes. And, like, that was, like, the one part of the museum that I was, like, super, super excited about. And I show up to that exhibit and it takes you just, like, through the evolution of life on our planet. So you start and you're learning about hydrothermal vents. And I'm like, ah, so excited. Um, <laughs> and then you go and you learn about like how life started forming and then boom, first mass extinction. And it's got like this amazing visual in there that just shows you kind of like all of time on earth that there's been life and how small humans are. Mm -hmm. And you keep walking through and it's just like so amazing to learn about each extinction and like what led up to that one specifically yeah. and see where life was, how it evolved. And then like, you know, uh, I know we've talked about one where like this like huge number of life in the oceans mm -hmm. just yeah that's disappearing just disappeared and I was just saying they're like I've never heard of this before and then eventually you see dinosaurs and then I eventually just forgot that I was even there to look at Sue and then we saw Sue and then eventually people came and then yes it was amazing no, we have to continue talking about this when I come when we come back from dinner because. I have input about it too. That yes. I'm waiting to share. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. okay. Go eat dinner. Have fun. So yeah, for any of our viewers that are interested in learning a bit more about mass extinctions, like what we were just talking about, I love the Chicago Field Museum so much. That was my first time ever going, and I learned so many things and did not even get to finish going through everything. But like that specific exhibit, I was of course super, super, super excited to see Sue, the T-Rex uh, fossil that they have, um, but I learned just so much about mass extinctions on our planet. Um, 
Is that a one-day um, kind of um, expedition, I, or did you spend several days there? I only went one day and did not get to see everything. Oh. And I think also I was taking a lot of time just, like, standing there, like, looking and mm -hmm. awe and, like... Um, I could see you taking more than one day. Yeah. And there's also the Shedd Aquarium, like very close by. And like I, like we didn't go there. Um, there are art museums. That was my first time in Chicago. So like I felt like I was nice. overwhelmed with like all of the things I wanted to do. But I knew I specifically wanted to go to that museum so I could see Sue the T-Rex. Um, and there were like a few other things that I really wanted to see. Mm. But yes. I don't know if you'd be able to accomplish it an entire day. Yeah, that sounds like a whole day. week's worth yeah. of visiting Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> and then the music, too. Yeah. Like, the music is supposed to... Isn't that where jazz, like, yeah. kind of um, was kind of uh, spread out from Chicago? I think yeah. that was the place. I don't know place. the history of, like, the origins of jazz, but we did go and listen and... I love live music, and that was also one of my like favorite parts. I had so much fun. Mm -hmm. Have yet to visit Chicago. I highly recommend. And it was if you know, with summertime, uh -huh. I have not been during the winter time, so I, I heard it's pretty brutal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my son went, and um, my daughter-in-law. It was pretty brutal. They were yeah. especially coming from Hawaii. Yeah. You know, you're not used to that, so. But yeah, so many great museums all over the world that I have yet to explore. Where are you, sponge? We see a sponge in Atalanta. Should be straight ahead. There it is. There it is. Yep, another one of those Podiopogon sponges, oh. the elephant ear sponge. And there's a small sea star at its base as well. Oh, yeah. We're going along in a pretty decent clip. We're going point three, so... Quick zoom. Uh, on the sea star, that's for sure. And then you want to see the sea star at the base after? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Sure. Right. Tilt your camera down. Where are you, Sea Star? There it is. Target required. Target acquired. Yeah, I saw one of those on the way. On the way, trucking along. Yeah, I remember seeing that one as well. The key fun thing is this one seesaw we're looking for, but they realize it's super shallow. Yeah. All right, come on. Thanks, Rennie. Right. Thank you. Bye, Rennie. Aloha, Rennie. Yep. I think it's above. I'm going to come up for a bit. Oh. Yeah.
they didn't want to hang out long. Just so our viewers are well we aware, we still have some dinner changes happening. So I was going to tell you, Malia, about um, something that's coming to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences that people are, like, very excited about. And it's an exhibit that's going to be called The Dueling Dinosaurs, because it's these fossils of a T-Rex and a Triceratops that, like, are locked in combat. <gasps> Whoa, yeah. that is so cool. Yeah, and I don't know the full story about like why they're coming to this specific uh -huh. museum and like why they're coming to North Carolina. Um, but so those were excited. actually found together as a fossilized record, or was it created by humans to kind of replicate a potential duel? From my understanding, they were found like this. Oh, very cool. And there are a lot of questions that people still have. Um, like, for example, like, how did they die? Were they fighting when they mm -hmm, died? Like, mm -hmm. both of them just died like this? Or did something else, like what we were just talking about, were there multiple causes? Right. Did something else happen that they both died? Um, and then, yeah. It's that white thing down there. That oh, is yeah. so interesting. Yeah, so that looks like a ferret sponge. And right now, we were looking at a very beautiful bamboo coral whip. And in front of it, uh, what looked like to me were uh, two uh, primnoid webs, sorry, a bamboo coral web and uh, two uh, primnoid webs. And it looks like another one of the sea cucumbers that we have been seeing. But sorry, I interrupted your conversation. <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah, I know when they bring those type of um, exhibits to the sure. Bishop Museum, it's a hugely oh. popular. Anything with dinosaurs. And you said the Bishop Museum? Bishop Museum, which is our um, state, um, Hawaii State Natural History Museum, named after our um, one of our ali'i, Bernice, uh, Princess Bernice Pawahi Bishop, mm. who left most of her lands to the Kamehameha Schools, one of the most premier academic um, institutions and richest um, in the world that uh, benefits Native Hawaiian Kanako OEV students. Mm. Wow. Yeah, you've told me about her before, but I didn't realize that that was who the museum was named after. Yeah. Lots of great impacts to, you know, modern um, Hawaiians. So pilots, uh, uh -huh. waypoint six is on this pinnacle. Do we want to sort of skirt around the edge and get over to waypoint seven? Or do you actually want to go up it and then go downhill? Do, do we have to go downhill either way? Um, around it? There's less downhill if we skirt this contour to this saddle and then go like that. Is there any benefit to like reaching the peak? Is that is there like a bio, like a sampling? Uh, not specifically as far as the dive plan is concerned. Let me check. One of the goals generally is to reach the peak, but uh, let me just check the dive plan one more Thank time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Yeah, I think unless we expect a, to take a rock sample or 
more diversity of corals and sponges, I'm not sure it'd be worth the uh, the trick of going downhill. From what I can understand, it should be fine because there's no specific objective about collecting a rock from the uh, from the top, specifically from that location. I think different uh, just surveying the biological diversity and getting rock samples from different parts of the sea mound is the overall uh, goal. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking at the transect, and it does look like this is the highest. That waypoint six is the highest point mm -hmm. on the okay. feature. So okay. I guess that might be of interest just to see the very top. Okay. Yes. I mean, I'm kind of a peak bagger, so that tends to be my <laughs> mentality. <laughs> yeah, waypoint six is the highest. Yeah, agree. and we can probably get a rock sample from the highest if that if the geologists find that interesting and then continue moving. Okay. As yeah, I guess it's always yeah. fun to reach the top. All right, well, thanks the for helping me spot. talk that through. I <laughs> talked myself out of my previous idea. <laughs> <laughs> Can't climb 90% of the mountain and uh, not I, hit the peak. I know, it's just, it's just too anticlimactic. <laughs> we got we to gotta go. That's a nice metallic gorge Derek, do you like hiking or climbing? Uh, love hiking, love backpacking. Oh. Yeah. Do it as much as I can. Where are some of your favorite places? Well, I live in New Hampshire, so like close to me, the White Mountains in Northern New Hampshire are quite nice. Um, and then if we're, <clears throat> I do like to do trips with the family to get further afield, like national parks, like we love Utah that whole region, the Southwest, Colorado, California. I've spent a lot of time in the Sierras, Alaska. Uh, pretty much anywhere we go, we try to get out and explore the local terrain. Nice. Yeah. You ever been up to uh, Curry Ridge by Denali? Uh, There's a campground up there. It's like uh, maybe 40 minutes before you get to the park. I don't think so. No. Um, it's a great place to go camp. Yeah, I once stayed at the a lodge at the end of the park road. I used to work for the company that r would run that lodge. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty awesome place. All the way at the end. Bridge nav. Could we please do a new move? I'd like to track a line bearing 155 at 0 0.3 knots. Thank you. Uh, bottom left there. Fish. Have we seen that? Yeah. Yeah, that's another metallogorgia. And is that a fish? Yeah, that's a question. Fish we saw at the beginning of the watch? Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, can we have a quick zoom if possible? Yeah. I think the zoom? Um, lateral line is the yeah. distinguishing. Yes. Yeah. So this is, would be another one of the... Uh, I have it open. Yes. 
Hawaiians is Kete Kete Tix Hawaiians is in the family um, birthday today. And let me see if I just I'm know, probably like butchering the genus name. Those but yeah, in the family birthday today, uh Kete Tix Hawaiians is. So it's one of the Ophidiform uh, fishes in the same group as the Cuskies, but slightly different. But they have this very distinct snout or nose that we only see in this uh, group. Thank you. Thank you so much. These are quite large fishes. We also saw, I think, two of those during our watches. These uh, key to take how I answer. Oh, it's a dead sponge, maybe that stick-like feature? Yeah, probably a dead uh, sponge or a dead whip. Oh, that looks like a nice shrimp coming in view. Probably a nematocar sinus. Another small metallogorgia to the right. Okay. Oh, there's another. This is a Halosauridae. Either a Halosaur or a Aldrovandia. A different fish. Mm, I love that squiggle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the E leg and a long bamboo whip to the left. This looks like one of those. Another metallogorgia. This looks like one of those beaked whale fossils. Oh, yeah. I probably. was going to say it looks not like a rock. <laughs> Should we do a all stop and take a quick, quick closer look? Or what we do? What's the speed of our mo ship move? 0 0.3. Hmm. Hmm. Full zoom. We can't do what? I don't think we're allowed to collect it. No, we, no, are, we, not. Are, not. we are not. We are not. Yeah, absolutely not. We are not. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not that's not only a, a national marine monument thing. That's a general, general like the, ocean yeah. thing. Collecting whale bones is not like permitted. Marine Mammal Protection Act or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Unless you're a museum. Oh, they probably use carcasses huh, for that that wash up. Uh, no. Oh, you mean like, like a natural history museum? Oh, or? yeah. Um, I'm not sure what they do for that, but yeah, they wouldn't get it from a from a whale fall on the seabed. But yeah, probably if it's a modern day whale, they would probably do it from like a beached thing. Yeah, that's a good. That's a cool find though, and it yeah. looked like it was coated in the manganese, so that's interesting. I'm really curious how long that's been there. Yeah, probably. I mean, if it has the manganese on it, it's not recent. Amazing. Yeah. Because right, that accretes over like like one milliliter per. I'm not, I, I couldn't put a number on it. I'm not really sure. It's very <laughs> yeah, it's slow like though. One milliliter per hundred years or something like that. Per hundred years. Or let me let me look oh, it yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> I think you guys were mentioning it the other day. That's. I think it's a lot slower than that. Or point one something. Yeah. It's point really one per hundred. Okay. Some um, number that was being. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just looked kind of it up. There's. Um, this resource from CORE, it says um, manganese accretion rates range from 1.7 to 8.7. Oh no, I don't know what this unit Mil is. <laughs> oh, MRN? I don't know what an MRN is, yeah, but it's no. per uh, no, 100. No. no. Okay, let me find per, another one. Per 106 <laughs> years, that's a random, random unit. 
Okay, here's another one from HU Journals, so that should be good. Millimeters per million years. Yeah, million, that millimeters per million years. Yeah, yeah, that makes that's, more sense. That tracks more with the yeah. so This would be another in the Hylosaurid family, in front of the bamboo whip. Uh, I like how he's drifting sideways with us. <laughs> oh, there's a, oh, hello. Oh, that's uh, oh. from the, Ooh, um, words. we saw these the other day, remember, Kara? I have it open, wait. <laughs> I think it's a guide It's on the tip form. of her tongue. It's, sorry? Fish? Yeah, it's one of, in the macro units, but yeah. it's the other one, which <laughs> probably an Antimora, if not the same family as the Antimoras. So we're almost at waypoint six, which is the actual summit of the seamount. And then we're going to have a Definitely little bit of downslope, uh, and we go. We're going to bounce between little peaks. Can be a Cenorhynchus or. I can get you a tighter yeah, shot here in a second. Oh. No, I would say it's zoom, a, yeah. yeah. I would say this is a Cori uh, Cori Oh yeah, most that looks probably. Right. Yep. Yeah, a Coryphenoides, a macrourid, uh, the same family as the rat tails. I can it's see that. It's a nice, big uh, Coryphenoides. Yeah. That's a nice observation. It's a good, uh, so yeah. good camera shot, too. Oh, wise. Mm -hmm. I wonder if the, the current is the current mm. strong here? Because it seemed like it was. More? Mm -hmm. It seems like it's pushing them and yeah, us. Yeah, right? Like the tail was moving, but yeah. it was going backwards. It's like the shrimp who swim by, they're like moving their legs super fast, but going really <laughs> slow. It's been a lot of fish on this. That was so cool. More than we saw on our watch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think this is the first seamount we saw Chana cops, at least on this expedition. Oh, uh, no, we, we had seen another Chana. one. Really? Yeah. OK, <laughs> maybe I missed that. Uh, you went on a ship to shore. No. Uh. Uh, I mean, it wasn't a Chana <laughs> cops, I'm not sure, but it was definitely the family Chana today. OK, OK. Chana cops and friends. We saw three on the last, <laughs> wait, was it last watch or last dive? Last uh, uh, last seamount. Last dive, yeah. Last yeah. dive. We That's a flight. Oh, well, the anatomy. They're so just like, yes. so adorable. The Chana. And they're so small. Chana cops? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is. It's just like so you just hold it in your they're hands. They're just so cute, yeah. They probably bite you, honestly, but. <laughs> I like how they stand on their little paws. Yeah, they're little they're feet. not paws, they're fins, fins, but. Fins. <laughs> it's just cute. More anemones passing by. So the Chana cops is the one that is like famous for like they brought it up from the deep and it's like a blobfish. It's uh, that same species I think it's that or one. the same family. I'm not sure, honestly, um, what that I is. Think, um, yeah, I don't know what the blobfish is, but I think the chonocops may be in the anglerfish family. Yeah, it's yeah, the ang think it's anglerfish. The same one. Hannah made some great biological uh, assessments over there. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're like, where'd she get all that knowledge from? <laughs> so, la uh, so Asterid? Yeah. I think it's so Ooh, fun that sea so stars, are, their family name is Asteroid, is it because they're stars? I think it's fun. We've got a sea urchin here, and a coral, and a sponge, and a, it's like a whole... It's a party. Yeah, it's like a yeah. whole ecosystem right here. That's a cool pattern on oh, this sea star. Shrimp. Oh, yeah. Are going to all more on that? This is like if Patrick <laughs> grew extra <laughs> little arms. <laughs> it's Patrick. Unit of Patrick. <laughs> Unit of Patrick. We have one Patrick. Mutant. Yeah. We have one how Patrick. would you? How does he wear his pants? <laughs> oh, wow, that's interesting. There's All a shrimp underneath this. Wh which stars. part would be pants and which part would be shirt? <laughs> yeah. You guys might kick me off the watch, but I've never actually watched SpongeBob. What? What? Yeah, you just have it. So yeah, That's not sure wild. I have either. I got everything I know about the characters is just from memes and stuff. I've never actually watched the show. <laughs> if it, well, my parents actually didn't allow me to watch SpongeBob growing up because they didn't want to hear SpongeBob's voice. And yeah, I that's oh, really I fair though. Yeah. That's, that's I'm, fair. I'm kind of with them on that. It's <laughs> it's not for any like reasons <laughs> that it's have to so do with like parents. <laughs> 
actually, Elsie, I remember you talking about Bikini Bottom, and you were like, it's based off a real place. And then I was like, wow, she actually like knows a lot about the lore. I was actually just, I was right, I was in Bikini uh, right before this actually. Yeah, yeah, so, so Mike, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, yeah, people kept mentioning it. I was like, yeah, this is Bikini Bottom, but there's no, no talking sponges here. Yeah. yeah. I've probably seen like 10 seconds of an episode That's somewhere. so sad. <laughs> I've only seen it because I have kids. I've made up for it by seeing probably every episode of Peppa Pig, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I think my parents, they didn't want us to watch Spongebob, but we watched it anyway. <laughs> Same with Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. My mom and dad did not want us to watch it, but I was like, well, I'm watching it anyway. What was wrong with that one? Because they were worried that it would rub off on me, that I would turn into a bad kid that, like, would disobey them. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, I guess you, that's... As you would. <laughs> I mean, I kind of did when I didn't listen to them and watch those anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so it was kind of a self-fulfilling yeah, prophecy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, uh, we weren't allowed to watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because Mom thought it was stupid. Oh, my gosh. Wait, oh. that just reminded me of, like... How old weren't there? No, no, no. <laughs> weren't there Teenage Mutant Turtle movies? That like yeah, live that action. Live a yeah, we didn't watch it. We weren't allowed oh, to watch those oh, either. Oh, I watched those. Uh -uh. I watched like all of them. There's a new movie that just came out. Like yeah, a, I want to see it. Cool animation style, yes. but I, I didn't get to see it. I haven't seen yeah. it yet either. Yeah. Crynoin. Um. I think it is. Yeah, the <laughs> sea gorgeous. lily. <laughs> I love. I love that you're. I think that, that is a paragorgia. <laughs> it is funny. Shout out to Mackenzie if you're listening. <laughs> I know, you might be. The gorgeous corals. Brzingid? I'm not even going to give a <laughs> answer. What was the shout out to before. your sister for? I missed it. She thought that she, when you're saying Paragorgia and oh, Brzingid, right, right. she thought Gorgia, that the Gorgia right. was a, yeah, was a short, yeah. short in, shorthand for gorgeous. 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 <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not. Maybe it is now. <laughs> it is now, exactly. What is this? That's a... It looks like, star. A, like it's a, a windmill. Coral, isn't it? Is that a cup? Is that a mushroom coral? That would have been the biggest mushroom coral we've seen. That is you're big. on mute. So. That is huge. Sebastian, you're on mute. That's also a big sea star. The sea star is pretty big too. Mm -hmm. I love, I love the way that, it, that it's on that rock. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, <laughs> very effective there. I'm imagine. <laughs> I'm looking at your hand motions. <laughs> now I can't unsee it. <laughs> Going in. Wow, that is a big, mu I don't know the wow. species, but it's a big mushroom coral. Is it or the family coral? or? It's either anthemasis or pseudoanthemasis, depending on. Five, six, seven, eight. Not sure exactly. It's a whole friends, organism. I think there's lasers in there, but they're a little far off. It's so big, I thought it was an anemone. There's a base. It's a really big anthemasis. I'm not hearing anything from the science chat, so... Basically. Any interest in that sea star while we're here? Yeah, may as well. <laughs> I really can't see anything except the hand now. It's, I couldn't... That was the first thing that came to my head as soon as I saw it. Good. Go I mean, even the coral's bent over looking at the star. I mean, look at... It looks like fingertips, like... Yeah. Like... Oh, looks like it'd be nice to pet. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'd want to pet it. What, Mike? You never t touch a sea star in a tide pool? I have. I didn't like it. Yeah, it wasn't my favorite. <laughs> 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 that might lead Coming to why up. I made that noise. <laughs> it's like it's holding on for dear life. It's a rock climbing sea star. Oh, why? No push. Little push. It's like turning your scuba tank on and then a little turn forward. Which I know you don't have to do anymore, no. but I still do. No. Look at all, look at all these pillow lavas. AKA also rock, rock fragments. <laughs> wow, I feel like we're so far away from it. Wow. 
lot of this is broken up. Yeah. Massive. This is a nice ridge. Yeah. Talgorgia, yeah. bamboos. Oh. <coughs> And we had a bunch of questions in the chat asking about um, the collection of um, the fossil or the marine mammal part. So um, remembering previous collections. So if you'd like more information about that, you can go to NOAA Fisheries webpage, Endangered Species Conservation and Protected Species Parts and their special um, permits uh, for research or for other reasons that um, they outlined there on that website. So if you want more information about that, uh, feel, free to, feel free to head over there. Yeah, and, and there may have been, I, I'm, I'm not familiar because I've been away from Nautilus expeditions for a bit, but right. there may have been instances Permit, in, yeah. in previous years that uh, there have been collections done and that would have been under specific permits to right. do so. And I, I don't know what that was, but I know that we are not permitted uh, this expedition yes. to touch yeah. or collect. So um, if anyone's seen that happen with other live expeditions, other, either us or Okeanos, or, um, that would have for sure been permitted, uh, right. but I, I can't speak to yeah, any yeah. specific instance on that. Right, and it might be like a case-by-case -case basis yeah, as people yeah. apply and for certain, permits. Certain scientists or PIs may have their own permits to do that sort of research, um, and that would have been worked out with uh, OET and and, uh, and the, you know, the scientists and, and the, the permitting agencies. Um, this looks like a low bait flow. I concur. I probably would have guessed that. I might have said sheep. I have to say. But it looks hummocky, so. It looks like it has some. Um, it looks don't what? Don't say it. Hummocky, he said? Hummocky? Hummocky. Yeah. Like, like, I feel that's mounds. worse than bacterial. It's not bacterial. It's don't worse don't sounding than bacterial. Hummocky. It's like large scale bacterial. And what's this guy on the left? I have to say, this seamount has had a lot of low bait flow every time at least every time that i've come on watch i've noticed that i've been writing down low bait flow a lot more hmm. than oh, other places that and that's like the medium speed right yes well that tells you something what is that but is that a shrimp again i wasn't on all the other watches so i don't know yeah. what the other ones look like i see i think there's some ophiorides but i can't tell what's on i think it might be a fallen over sponge I think there's two of them. Two of them. Can we zoom? Go for zoom. Going in. There's a sponge behind it, too. Oh, maybe three. Oh, it's um, uh, up your eyes around two branches of yeah. uh, family. Yeah, that. strange. Have you guys seen an ophiroid jump off of a coral yet? Several. <laughs> what? Yeah. 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 That's always fun. <laughs> We've seen them abandon ships as we come by. Yeah. Like, it's too bright. I gotta it's go. It's pretty funny. I've seen them on the seafloor jump. What? Yeah. Like, jump up what? into the water? No, just forward. Oh. We had a... Uh, a squat lobster jump onto the porch of the vehicle. Yeah. Whoa. And he was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Take this ROV to Cuba. <laughs> oh, there's a, I'm oh, there was a jelly in the Atalanta yeah, view. Yeah, that was a Tina 4, I saw it. The lobster's like, I'm commandeering this ROV. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I forgot to switch to you. Wow. Oh, is this the Tina? Yep. Is this the Tina four? That's probably no, a not the one oh, they saw. Oh, wow, I, it's okay. Is that, that a, is that a siphonophore? Um, can we get a zoom in on the head? Go for zoom. Gone in. Holding here and letting it come to us. Gone in a little oh. more. Where are you? <laughs> I... Hurry up, because it's impossible to focus. I am leaning towards this being a very weird looking siphonophore. <laughs> yeah, it looks like ones we saw of Spain. 
Oh, it's like breaking oh, apart. Yeah, yeah, it's, like breaking. Just yeah it's breaking apart. That's weird. Okay. Was it like a group of no. individuals? That's yeah, Siphonophores are a colony. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, I thought you were looking at the Siphonophore. <laughs> She's looking at the rock still. <laughs> That was a pretty cool biological observation, though, like it breaking apart. Oh, sorry, on to the geology. <laughs> Hannah, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. I'll turn up your side tone, so you should hear yourself pretty loud Hello? when you're not muted. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Hold on just a sec. You're at Psy, right? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was just saying, um, the low bait flow, I, I'm amazed by how much of the seamount that every time I've come on, it's just been low bait flows, usually. So, it's Anna, beautiful. <laughs> if you say something now, do you sound louder in your headset than you did before? Uh, yes. So that's a good way to tell if you're muted or not. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And then the other good test for volume is if you put your lips out like you're kissing, they should touch your microphone. That's how close oh, it needs to be. Gross. It should or it shouldn't? It should. should be that close. No. Uh, okay, well, now it's not close. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, that tip. That's why you have your own. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's kind of gross that we didn't used to. <laughs> yeah, and at the end of each leg, we uh, clean all of these and we throw away the ear the uh, yeah ear thing in the mic windscreen urchin over there appreciated and uh disinfect them all that's probably the number one thing you can do to you know to prevent COVID and other things that's yeah probably should have been doing that years ago well these things I, they are not exactly sturdy and no, they're not. <laughs> they are uh not exactly cheap either But amazingly, now that everybody has their own, none of them are breaking. <laughs> yeah, it's it, they're used less, but they're also like passed off less. And also we have, like we care for our own. And it used to be a watch change too. People would take the headset off and it would get, you know, the cord would get wrapped around yeah, the yeah, arm yeah. of the chair and the person who went to sit down next would just yeah. tear it apart. Yeah, no, it's a good system, Co you know, Irrespective of COVID, I think it's a good system. Yeah. Uh, we had a question come in. What's special about low bait flow? Could you share about that, Hannah? <laughs> You're like, I can tell you about low bait flow for days. <laughs> no, actually, it's kind of, I just like it because I usually am able to tell a sheet flow very fast and because it's just like flat and then pillow lavas again the mostly what we pick up and, or, or debris and low beat it's it's really really cool because it's in the middle right so it's the medium fast speed that is, is being produced the lava flow and i just i think it's just so cool because it it's almost like a mix, a perfect mixture between like a pillow lava and a sheet flow. So like it's all together, and they look like like little pillow like not like nodules, right? But it's still cemented together, and it's still like even though it has like that sediment crease in it, it's still connected. And I just think it's so cool that it's the like perfect mixture of both of them. Yeah, I can kind of picture it. So sheet lava, the lava's moving so fast it just coats yes. the hillside with lava. Yes. Pillow basalt, it's moving slowly, so it does that thing where it like pushes itself out after it's, mm -hmm. as it's cooling. Mm -hmm. And then this is kind of in between. It's going slowly, so it's cooling, but it's moving fast enough that it doesn't push itself out. Yes. So yeah, I, I can totally picture that. So it's like a per like a happy medium, and it makes <laughs> sense. It like makes sense in my head. Yeah. And so. <laughs> Do the other ones not make? make no, they make sense? they make sense, but I love how low bait is a combination of both of those, okay. and it makes. And you can see how it is. Exactly. Yeah, like, like it's it. visual. Especially mm. this seamount, we've been seeing it visually well, like so well, 
this whole time and I, I love it. Mm. I love it. And just for a recap, the three types were sheet, low bait, pillow. pillow. Okay. Yes. Correct. <laughs> so yeah, we are yeah. very close to the summit of this seamount and then the next um, the next rest of the, the rest of the dive will be um, sort of bouncing along ridges or um, other little highs along it. So there'll be some downward as well movement. I wonder if this rock is vesicular. Just curious. What would a vesicular rock be? It's it has like these pockets of like gas and um I'm just yeah, trying to see like if this it. is botryo botryoidal or vesicular. I can't tell. I'm just curious. I can't, I really can't tell. I think it's just botryoidal. Yeah, it looks very botryoidal to me. Yes. <laughs> and it's a low bait flow. You trying to get that thing on the left there? Or no, we're good to not. Disregard. Thank you. Thank you for the zoom. But what I've noticed on a few of the rocks that we've picked up at previous seamounts, if they have the vesicular texture in the manganese crust, then it, it is most likely a vesicular rock on the inside of the manganese crust. Are we due to collect a rock? Wait, what? Are we due to collect a rock? Oh yeah, we're at the summit, oh. we probably should. <gasps> oh, wow. It's rock o'clock. Oh, is this another... This is a tinafar, <laughs> I believe. Tinafar. It doesn't have a it's coral in its mouth? What? What? I'm that's just trying to think what it's holding on to. No, that's its arm. That's its tentacles. <gasps> yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Oh. oh that's our oh thruster wash. We're too close to it. Yep. Oh, well. I thought it was oh. holding something. That was crazy. That was a gorgeous TFR. That was so pretty. Rock o'clock. So Ooh. we're not quite at the summit yet. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, we're, we're getting there. I think that's, that is a good spot to take oh. a, uh, got a rock. We've 84 though. meters to go. Good idea. Okay. It's too bad we have such little interest in the rock samples on this watch. <laughs> Joking. <laughs> <laughs> if y'all could have seen my face. <laughs> she was like, but I love the rocks. <laughs> I was like, there's wrong. Just, there's just no excitement wrong. at all. <laughs> I think we get excited about the rocks on our watch, but we just don't know what we're looking at. <laughs> Yeah. We'll be like, wow, this is such an interesting geological feature. Well, it's cool for me because I, you know, I've taken geology classes and volcano classes, but I've never seen, you know, live exploration. I've not been part of it on volcanic rock, so this is pretty cool. Neither have I. This well, is my yeah, first time. It's true. So it makes me wonder. I just I can't get that beaked whale bone out of my mind. Yeah. <laughs> like, how are we supposed to l learn more about them and how old they are if we can't? Well, at that point, if they're covered in manganese like what we see here, that species is probably long um, either extinct or likely evolved in something else by now. Is that makes me more purpose, interested. Yeah. So <laughs> there, yeah, I mean, it's it's not the sort of thing that we can just like collect. Uh, opportunistically. Opportunistically, it would have to be like a targeted. Well, well that's the thing. Like, you yeah. can't do a targeted survey yeah. for whale bones because you're. you're well, not, you yeah, can, I you think can search for weeks and never stumble across. But one. we have a position now for one. So if someone wants to <laughs> go to, through the permitting, you know, I mean, but really, you could take that information from this cruise. Well, if, you, if there's a, you the know, positioning is a fair amount of uncertainty in it. Yeah. It's not like we can just go right back to that spot. Well. 
just saying. I should, it's a theoretical question. I'm not saying we should have. Yeah, no, I had like the same thought too. I was, I was wondering. just wondering, like, how do we? Uh, I, I'm intrigued by them, I guess, and I'd love to learn more about, like. From what I understand, the the, the no collect is mostly here in the monuments, and the ones that we collected before were not were in international water. Okay. So I think that we were in the clear to collect those. Well, I know that we were not allowed to touch to collect anything in uh, off California. Or no, that was in the Gulf. I don't remember. I bet you Daniel has some actual information he can share <laughs> with you at some point. We won't speculate further. I was just, uh, it's just very intriguing. Any further t talk of this is conjecture. Exactly. Are you looking to <laughs> collect it, maybe extract the DNA and open a little establishment on Kauai where you uh, recreate the organism? No. A bunch we of are, are we they, showed us, <laughs> they showed us how that went in the early 90s. Are we doing that? Mm -hmm. Are we pulling the mammoth here with the, the, for the ancient um, dolphins? Oh, are you talking about the mammoth that they like tried to? To try to resurrect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were so about. concerned with whether they should, with whether they could. They didn't ask if they could. If, <laughs> if they, they should, they could. <laughs> they never did asked they, if they could. Did you see <laughs> the whole thing where they made a mammoth meatball and auctioned it off? What? No. I yeah. did see is that. Is this a movie or real? No, this is real. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> what are we discussing? Unclear. <laughs> Unclear. Okay. Um, clearly, ma um, we're discussing um, the legality of collecting um, beaked no. whale bones That's off the seafloor. Right? We saw one, Tori. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I'm like reading the chat and I'm like, why are we talking about beaked oh, whales? Yeah. Oh. Just a disregard. bone, not an actual beaked whale. Wait, was did that just happen while I've been sitting here? The no, whale bone. It was oh, a f oh, whale fossil, yeah, fossilized whale like, bone. I did not see this. Mm -hmm. All good things happen at dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, honestly. We collected a fair amount of them um, on the past cruises, and I don't. From my understanding, from what Steve was saying and others, is that there's, uh, we're kind of we're kind of good on that for a bit. Thanks, also, Trini. yeah, we're not allowed to collect in Papua uh, Nama, Papua but we we did collect some. Um, in Johnston, where oh, okay. we, the permits were less uh, stringent. Good to know. Thanks, Thanks Rennie. Yeah. See, he is in the system. He's just the ghost in the machine. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you, Lounge. <laughs> I was thinking uh, data, data lab. Data He's lab, not in I think. Here. Lounge. <laughs> lounge. Lounge. All right. He's working on the puzzle. Lounge. He Rennie, escaped. Rennie never sleeps. The ghost He's of the escaped. machine. I'm behind the racks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nowhere. <laughs> He's on Atlanta. You'll <laughs> never one. find me. Robert at We got a fish coming. There it Hello. is. Hello. You're very round. Chicken nugget. <laughs> Chicken nugget. Oh, oh. Bonk. Oh, oh. <laughs> Donald. <laughs> Bonk. <laughs> I just want to warn him, you know. Can we get a zoom? Go for zoom. Go on in. Oh, oh, oh. the other way. Take out. Oh, it's so cute. Oh. Can't, he's like, it's I can't see. Oh. But you can't see anyway. Coming out. It's a cuskiel. Pretty sure. Poohy. I mean, they really Pretty. look like giant tadpoles. Yeah, they do. Oh, come on, Harris. Pick a direction. And not decide on which <laughs> way <laughs> they want to go. So we are, I would I'd say this is a summit. We're right next to waypoint six. All right, how do these look for rocks? Okay, I'm looking. Can we attach the fish to the rock? Give me a moment. Scan I have to get around. situated. These look fairly rounded, don't they? Okay. Oh, we're at the summit. I didn't realize it. Yeah. Yay. So this is the highest point of our dive, and I believe the entire seamount. Yep. Mm -hmm. Woohoo! Massive. Hello, baby. Oh, look at those. You can't collect that. Yes. <laughs> Hercules strong. Well, yeah, this will be the, the high point. This will be the high point. <laughs> yeah, we were quite yeah. there. You can't get 99% of the way there. That almost looks pillow, doesn't it? Yeah. I know. This looks so cool. I'm not sure there's loose rock up here, though. Yeah, yeah it doesn't look right loose here. at all. Get all the way to the well, top, okay. and there's we a piece of rock. this over here, there could be. Yeah. Go there. We'll go look for the USGS uh, marker. Yeah. Oh, the USGS. Uh -huh. The what marker? US USGS marker. Oh, yeah, like when you're mountain climbing? Yeah. Yeah. Those are fun. Not part of the PCT. Let's see if I can, like, I no, I'm not going to trust myself for eyeing one this far away. I would probably look over here. 
Ship's or over right here. here. <laughs> but yeah, Ship's any of those. Uh, yeah. Bridge nap. E brake, please. That's a round one. <laughs> All stop, please. Do you want here or do you want?